Hey everyone, it's Eric from Strong Medicine, and today I'm talking about school reopenings and COVID. I've been a little reluctant to discuss this here because there's uh, some pretty strong opinions on all sides, which tends to make the comment section excessively colorful and in need of moderation, but it's a huge topic and it's hard to ignore, particularly when I have two young children myself. This is all news for you, but the debate can be oversimplified into two sides, open schools now versus keep them virtual until some unspecified future time. Most arguments on the side of opening now are that kids learn better in person than remotely, and that kids at home limits parents' ability to work, thus limiting recovery from an economic standpoint. And both those arguments are to some extent true. Most arguments on the side of keeping schools virtual are that kids will get sick from COVID and they'll serve as vectors for transmission to parents and teachers, thus limiting recovery from a public health standpoint. And both of those are to some extent true as well. And there we have the problem. This is not like the debate about mandatory masks in which the logic and science are all on one side. With school reopenings, there is more than one reasonable, defensible position. And anyone on TV or the web who is claiming otherwise, implying that the correct course of action is overwhelmingly obvious, that person has not thought through all the issues. It's a far more nuanced discussion than can be conveyed in a tweet or a 10 second soundbite. So if you are expecting me by the end of this video to pick a side, you will be disappointed. And that's not just because I don't know the right answer. It's also because the right answer is community specific, school specific, and child specific. But what I will do here is to go through all of the uh, many considerations at play and talk about our own family's decision so that when you reach your own conclusion about your own family, your decision making process can be as comprehensive as possible we can subdivide the considerations into ones that are related to the virus itself, to the community, to the school, to the teachers, to the family, and to the individual child. I'll go through each category one at a time. First is the virus. Questions directly related to the virus itself that we need to ask are, how often do children become seriously ill or die from COVID? Number two, how much do children serve as vectors of transmission to adults? The first of these is easier to answer. In the US, data from 14 states during the first four months of the pandemic had a cumulative rate of COVID-associated hospitalizations among children of eight per 100,000 population, while adults in those same states had a cumulative hospitalization rate of 165 per 100,000. In short, taken as a whole, kids during the pandemic have been far less likely to require hospitalization than adults. Although much has been discussed about the horrific COVID complication called multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children, thankfully, it remains rare. Uh, and according to data from the American Academy of Pediatrics, from the beginning of the outbreak, the case fatality rate among children over the age of four appears to have been about 0.02%, or one in 5,000, and has steadily de declined throughout the pandemic presumably as our understanding of the, the disease has improved and as our detection of clinically mild cases has increased. Children under four have a substantially higher case fatality rate. Overall, while every death and prolonged ICU stay among children is tragic, the risk of COVID among otherwise healthy school-aged children appears to be quite low. I know that some politicians have come under fire for claiming that seasonal influenza is a bigger risk to kids than COVID. And while comparing the two is difficult, I think that oversimplified characterization is largely true, but only in school-aged children. COVID is far, far worse than the flu in adults and probably worse than the flu in infants and toddlers. Next question. How often do mildly symptomatic or asymptomatic children pass the, on the disease to adults? In other words, are kids silent spreaders and major drivers of the pandemic? Unfortunately, the jury is still out with this with conflicting data. On one hand, we have studies like one from South Korea that looked at contact tracing to characterize transmission risk and which found that children under the age of nine had relatively low risk of transmission to household contacts 
while those ages 10 to 19 had relatively high risk. Other studies have found that when symptomatic from COVID, younger children have significantly higher viral loads present in their nasal pharynx than adults do, suggesting the possibility that they are much more contagious. So you end up with conflicting opinion pieces online, while the experts kind of shrug their shoulders and state, we just don't know yet. Moving on to the community questions. One, what is the current incidence in the community in which the school is located? And two, what are the other outbreak mitigation strategies that are being employed? When it comes to the incidents, county health departments are a good source of information, though not perfect because a significant number of cases go undetected. But the current incidents, combined with data such as test positivity rate, can provide a ballpark understanding of how a specific community is doing, as well as its trend over time. Regarding other mitigation strategies, you may have heard of a concept called the exposure budget or contact budget. With this idea, one considers that we all have a certain level of risk of catching COVID that we are willing to accept in order to do a particular set of daily activities. Every activity outside the, ho outside the home potentially exposes us to COVID, and those cumulative exposures are additive inching us closer to the total net acceptable risk. No matter how much risk a parent is willing to accept for their child, the risk of sending them to school every day will take up a large amount of the total acceptable risk. In other words, it takes up a huge amount of the child's exposure budget. So we need to consider whether other activities and exposures can be curtailed in order for a child's net risk to still fall below our acceptable threshold. Deciding between school versus church versus socially distanced recreation versus getting a haircut or visiting the dentist, these may all be really unpalatable choices for many, but this is the basic concept behind the idea of the exposure budget. When it comes to school considerations, there are questions about physical space. For example, does the school have room for everyone to be six feet apart? Do they have the necessary teachers since class size might be reduced because of the need for social distancing? Will they be able to keep a single group of students together throughout the day, which uh, decreases the size of outbreaks when they happen? What system do they have in place for contact tracing? Will schools inform patients about each positive case? Can they enforce social distancing and mask wearing in the school? Uh, is the school in a warm, dry climate in which outdoor glass, uh, classes and lunches are an option since it's very well established that outdoor activities are at far lower risk? Beyond the question of physical space and social distancing, there are also questions of how well a school can provide a remote learning experience. Have teachers had sufficient training in not just the software, which is not that hard, but also the different pedagogies and means of assessment and feedback when teaching remotely or teaching virtually. It's not the same as teaching in the classroom. Do the schools have resources to lend computers to students who don't have them otherwise? Now we have teacher-related considerations. How much risk do teachers have from contracting COVID while working at the schools? And not just teachers, but we're also talking about uh, kitchen staff, janitorial staff, other support staff, etc. Do teachers and administrators take proper precautions themselves while at work? Do they avoid large gatherings and wear face masks during faculty meetings and in break rooms? For example, uh, this happened right here in Santa Clara County last month when a COVID positive administrator exposed 44 other administrators during a meeting that could easily have been conducted on Zoom and during which some attendees were rumored to have been without masks. How many teachers will take steps to avoid teaching in person if they feel unsafe? I'm not talking about calling in sick because obviously uh, a teacher can't call in sick for an entire semester, but for example, some districts allow teachers to take an unpaid leave of absence if they've already put in a certain number of years at that district. Um, for those districts that do that, I would expect those numbers to be much, much higher than normal um, in those districts that are resuming in-person classes. And I'd also expect a large bullet of teachers will be retiring this year. And what happens when teachers become ill or are just exposed and need a 10 to 14 day quarantine period? Who teaches then? Substitute teaching is already an undesirable role. I would expect a smaller pool of individuals willing to substitute this year, especially if they are moving from classroom to classroom 
since being exposed to a different group of students every one to two weeks or even one to two days will significantly increase their COVID risk, even above that of the normal classroom teacher. Let's talk about family considerations. An obvious one might be whether a family has an elderly or immune-compromised individual in the home who would be at a particularly high risk of death if they caught COVID from a child who caught it at school. But there are also considerations of things like available resources to support a home learning environment. For example, does the family have a reliable internet connection? Do they have a dedicated computer for each child? You know, if a, if a family has four children, they kind of need four computers for those children to be actively engaged in their schoolwork throughout the day. Is there someone able to watch the child at home and able to provide help and support as needed? One of the most under-discussed consequences of remote learning, in my opinion, is that students who are already socially or economically disadvantaged will be the most adversely affected since their parents are less likely to be able to work from home and will have less resources available to them to support the learning environment. We should expect that prolonged remote learning will have a long-term effect to further widen economic disparities. And speaking of economic disparities, what do parents do if they are unable to work from home? You know, they can either you know, quit their jobs, um, they can pay for someone else to watch their children, or have their children stay with peers during the day, all of which are disadvantageous. And finally, there are considerations for the individual child. It's a specific child at higher than normal risk of COVID because of a health condition. Uh, does the child rely on school for free or reduced price meals? Does a child have a learning disability that requires in-person educational expertise? Uh, and also, um, how effective is remote learning versus in-person learning for that particular child? This will be different from child to child and is definitely very different across age groups. Our 10-year-old has been doing pretty well with his first two weeks of remote learning. He can manage the software independently, he can stay on task for hours at a time, and he can be independently responsible for a specific list of assignments each day. But with our six-year-old, it is a constant struggle. She has a 20-minute attention span on Zoom, and any independent work ironically needs to be directly supervised almost constantly, or it just doesn't get done. The difference in how well children of different ages do with remote learning, combined with the increased need for in-person social interaction at younger ages, and the lower risk of serious illness at younger ages, is why I very strongly feel that elementary schools should reopen earlier than high schools, and why high schools should reopen earlier than universities. That was a pretty exhaustive list of things to consider when deciding on when to reopen schools. While it might have felt tedious, the point of going through all this was to show why this question is so difficult to answer. In addition, because some of these considerations are specific to the school or the community, the threshold of when schools should open versus staying remote will necessarily be different everywhere. So when you hear someone making an impassioned argument one way or another, who comes from a different town or is in a different state, you should not assume those arguments would apply exactly the same way wherever you live. Now, what are we doing with our own family? You know, I mentioned I have two small children. Um, for us here in the San Francisco Bay Area, our local school district had a proposal in the midsummer that would have allowed for full in-person schooling for those families who wanted it. This proposal was made possible by a significant budget surplus, sufficient physical space, and a nearly perfect balance of teachers and parents wanting to do in-person versus remote instruction. We felt ready to send our children back to school because the district's plan felt robust and safe to us, because children are at low COVID risk, as mentioned before, because no one in our household is elderly or immunocompromised, because neither my wife nor I can fully work from home, and because we know that our youngest in particular is in need of in-person instruction and peer social interactions. While we were nervous about the decision, the risk-benefit ratio, it seemed favorable. However, the state of California intervened and prevented reopening of the schools in our district, along with other districts in our county, on the grounds that the incidence of COVID in our county was still too high. So it's remote learning for now for our family, um, with which we are making do the best we can. 
To be clear, while, while we were in favor of in-person schooling for our children in our district and in our community, there are many places around the country in which we would have reached the opposite decision. And if our children were older, we would have reached the opposite decision. And if either my wife or I could fully work from home, we probably would have reached the opposite decision. As just one of countless examples, CNN health correspondent Sanjay Gupta did a big story on his family's decision to keep his kids in remote schooling, which I have no doubt was the right decision for them. The bottom line is that this is a really complicated problem. So I'm sorry I don't have a specific answer, but I did tell you at the beginning that I wouldn't. At the very least, I hope that discussion was helpful for you to make up your own mind about uh, this issue. You may have noticed that I have not discussed universities and medical schools. Literally every single argument in favor of remote learning at the university level applies more than it did to primary and secondary schools. So in my opinion, universities have made the right decision to be all remote this semester. That does not mean I have a solid idea of when it will be appropriate to resume in-person classes or how that should be done but I think it likely won't happen until after a safe and effective vaccine is widely available. Speaking of which, if you'd like to know more about ongoing work on a vaccine or would like to subscribe to get updates on COVID and other health-related topics, click on the relevant link somewhere on the screen. So that's, uh, that's all I have for today. Stay safe.